The year is 1945. The place? Hollapaw, Florida, about halfway between St. Cloud and the Brevard County line. And it looked pretty much then the same as it does now. A lot of trees, which really was a lot of potential lumber for the war effort. Back in 1945, Hollapaw was a company town, all centered around the sawmill at the P.B. Wilson Works. At the time, logging was a labor-intensive job, and a lot of the local residents had joined the military and gone off to war. But Central Florida was able to supplement its meager workforce thanks to the capture of Rommel's Africa Corps. About 725 of these captured POWs were assigned to the camp at Orlando Air Force Base. One of the work sites that POWs were assigned to was to the P.V. Wilson Lumber Works in Hollipaw. And on October 26, 1945, a group of POWs headed out to the sawmill. Among them was 20-year-old George Moose, who grew up in the Rhine River Valley and was captured in Italy in 1944. During the workday, Private First Class Moose was hit by a falling tree and rushed to the base hospital. But the base hospital was more than 30 miles away. With fractures in his 4th, 5th, and 6th vertebrae and a compression fracture of the spine, he died later that day. Oddly enough, Germany had already surrendered back in May, and the war in Europe was over. George Moose was buried with full military honors, including 65 other POWs attending a church service, and three volleys being fired over his grave. His coffin would have been covered with a German national flag. He was buried at a special POW graveyard in Camp Landing. And along with six comrades, those bodies were reinterned in Fort Benning, Georgia. The work camp in Orlando was also home to the escaped king of Florida, Gefreiter Fritz Dreschler. Dreschler had already seen his face on an FBI wanted card from his escape when he was in a camp in Tennessee. And Dreschler wasn't just any soldier, he was an SS soldier. And not just in any unit, he was with the 16th SS Division. Of all the civilians murdered in Italy, fully one-third of those were killed by the 16th, including the worst of 770 civilians at Marazabato. After the war, 17 of the 16th's officers were indicted for war crimes. After receiving a bullet wound on the Eastern Front, Dressler was sent back to Germany to recuperate. From there, he was returned to his unit that was by now in Italy. And it was in Italy that Dressler became a POW. So you might imagine that the citizens of Orlando were on their guard when they heard he was loose. While the first two time he beat feet in Orlando, he was able to make it as far as Tampa before being picked up by authorities. According to newspaper reports at the time, it seemed as if Dressler was ready to put up a fight when confronted by Charles Weaver, who was responding to a report of a peeping Tom in the neighborhood. That is until Charles Weaver pulled out his pistol. Dressler surrendered. After his second arrest in Tampa, he was turned over to military authorities and then made a short third escape when he ended up as far north as Walterboro, South Carolina. Ironically, Walterboro itself was home to another POW camp. So it's possible that Dressler was held here at the jail cell that still remains at the old airport. You see, apparently, as a soldier of the SS who had seen duty on the Eastern Front, he had no desire to return to his part of Germany, which was now under control of the Russians. And really, who can blame him? Orlando Army Air Base not only included what's now known as Orlando Executive Airport, but the area west of it, which is now known as the Orlando Festival Park. Its base headquarters was located just across the parking lot. You can even see the cul-de-sac where the flagpole used to stand. The airbase had been steadily growing since 1940 with the arrival of the Air Corps Tactical School from Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Here, B-29 bomber crews were trained in the latest tactics and strategies, along with some more specialized air crews. Its large size made it the perfect place to put a POW camp. But we'll talk more about the base in another video. And Orlando wasn't the only POW camp in Central Florida. There was also a large camp in Leesburg. Leesburg opened in January 1943 and was home to the 313th Fighter Squadron, training pilots on how to fly the P-40 Warhawk, and also the 1158th School Squadron, 
the trained pilots in the twin-engine P-38 Lightning. After completing classroom training in Orlando, ground operators were sent to Leesburg for practical training on the SCR-527 radar system. As you can imagine, training like this required a lot of acreage, and a lot of acreage meant there was room left over for a POW camp. So, after the 313th left, the POWs moved in. Camp administration was carried out by military as well as civilian personnel. Initially, the prisoners were housed in a tent city, possibly right here along Ice Cream Road in Leesburg. They were later transferred to the other side of Leesburg, where more permanent housing was built by Paul Miller Construction on what is now the site of the Lake Sumter Community College. Leesburg's POWs were put to work in the citrus groves, at truck farms, and at packing plants throughout the county. A group of about 50 POWs was contracted out to the Paul Miller Construction Company, who'd actually built the barracks they were living in, and they helped to build some homes here on 9th Street in Leesburg. The only problem Mr. Miller remembers with them was when some of the POW carpenters made the lettuce work into swastikas on the houses. He had them replace it the same day. I can only imagine what the residents of the sleepy little town of Leesburg would have thought if they were allowed to remain. Especially since Miller later served as councilman and mayor. Eventually there'd be 250 POWs calling the Leesburg camp home. In his excellent book, Hitler's Soldiers in the Sunshine State, Robert Billinger notes there was one period of concern when 200 of the elite Africa Corps were temporarily housed with what they considered 200 of the lesser troops. There were some tense moments during that one month period. But soon enough, all the troublemakers were shipped out to different camps and everything got pretty much back to normal. Now, we've talked a lot about the Army bases, and yes, it was the Army's Provost Marshal General who was in charge of the POW camps in the United States. But there were also POW camps located in naval bases throughout Central Florida, like the Banana River Naval Air Station. Located just south of Cocoa Beach in Brevard County, the main mission of the Banana River NAS was Coastal Patrol. They were keeping an eye out for German U-boats along Florida's coastline. And they used both the K-Class and L-Class Coastal Patrol airships as they were able to spend hours out on patrol. And if they spotted a U-boat, well, that's where the Martin Mariners came in. They were able to be outfitted with both bombs and torpedoes. Although envisioned as an amphibious Coastal Patrol bomber, the Coast Guard also acquired several Martins to be used for rescue and recovery. So it only makes sense that years later, after being transferred to the Air Force and becoming Patrick Air Force Base, the base kept its rescue mission in the form of the 920th Rescue Wing. Set up in August of 1945, it was a small contingent of 148 prisoners guarded by 20 military police guards. Most of the POWs just worked cleanup details around the base. One of the inspectors visiting Banana River noted a decline in the morale of the troops after the administration became suspicious of the education program there. It seems they discovered a painting of Hitler secreted between pieces of blackboard in the mess hall. It turns out the painting was made by one of the teachers in the education program, somebody who'd been in a trusted position. And, like Orlando, Banana River saw their own untimely death when Private Rudolf Stamaker from Graz, Austria, drowned in the Banana River while he was on a work detail. He was interred in grave 188 of Section A2, also at Fort Benning. Just a little ways further down the coast was the Naval Training Base at the Melbourne Naval Air Station. Here, new pilots were trained by some of the best pilots the Navy had to offer like Medal of Honor winner Captain Dave McCampbell. He was an ace, with over 34 kills in the Japanese theater. And it wasn't just the instructors who were a big deal. Some of the trainees turned out to be a pretty big deal, too. Like actor-turned-lieutenant Wayne Morris, his training at Melbourne Air Station led to seven kills in the Pacific. Another trainee from Melbourne retired as a rear admiral. George Morrison served in three wars, including being in charge of the naval forces in the Gulf of Tonkin, well, during the Gulf of Tonkin incident. But he's probably more famous for his son, 
Jimmy. Turns out Jim made a pretty big name for himself, too. Again, the POW camp in Melbourne held 148 POWs, along with 20 military policemen. Of the POWs, only 18 Germans worked in the administrative and mess halls of the POW compound and the American Administrative Unit, with 130 working in and around a naval air station, 75 of whom were on laundry detail at night. 2008 saw 286,000 people land and take off commercially from Melbourne, and in 2015, wanting to be seen as an alternative to the crowded Orlando International, they rebranded themselves the Orlando Melbourne International Airport. Although Orlando's 70 miles away, that's kind of like landing in Philly to go to New York. It's at this point I think we ought to head up north to Daytona, because Daytona was an unusual POW camp, which combined the Halifax District Hospital and what used to be a whack base. Originally being found as a training base for the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, they were later changed over to the Women's Army Corps, and a year after that, the base was closed and all the WACs were transferred up to Fort Oglethorpe in Georgia. The women's barracks were located adjacent to the Halifax District Hospital, where many of the women trained as nurses. Located directly behind the Halifax District Hospital, other buildings were built and added onto it and it became the Welsh Convalescent Hospital, where military members could rehabilitate after they were injured. Here they could attend concerts put on at the band shell that had been recently built by the Works Progress Administration during the Depression. One of the newspapers at the time dedicated a whole article to the fact that the Army was going to rent City Island baseball field from the city and revamp the lighting so that they could use it as part of their reconditioning program by the soldiers in the convalescent hospital. They stated that the work was going to be overseen by none other than Cy Young and the coach was going to be First Lieutenant Robert Earl Grace who played for Pittsburgh and the Phillies. But Daytona Beach wasn't all just World War II fun and games. There was a large naval air station with training held by Embry-Riddle. Plus, of course, Coastal Patrol itself. After the wax had moved out, the U.S. Army Signal Corps Training Center was opened. Your Army members trained in the latest forms of signaling, like pigeons. And then there was Welch Convalescent Hospital itself, where POWs worked as orderlies on the ground. And it was quite a large camp, too, with five barracks, each containing about 51 men. And one of those POWs was SS Panzer Grenadier Werner Jentz. Again, like fellow SS member Fritz Dreschler, Jentz had no desire to return to his part of Germany either. Jentz had quite the little outing on his escape, first hitchhiking to New Smyrna Beach from Daytona Beach. From New Smyrna Beach, he hopped a freight train and headed south towards Miami. I mean, Jens surely had to know, like everybody on the East Coast did, that Miami was one of the major training sites that was just crawling with military police. Jens later said he spent his time swimming and looking for work in the city of Miami. I'm not sure at this time in Miami how he expected to find a job where he wouldn't have any interaction with the military. The place really did have a large contingent of military police, both on foot and motorized. But in the end, it was local law enforcement that caught Jens sleeping in the back of a truck. During his week's vacation in Miami, Jentz had been the subject of a massive FBI manhunt. The Daytona Beach Evening News had described the SS trooper as an ardent Nazi. And at 6 feet 2 inches tall, when most of the Germans were 5'6 or 5'7, he could seem fairly threatening. The FBI special agent in charge, R.G. Danner, also told the press that Jentz, who was 22, had been an SS member and may be dangerous. But the press was also quick to point out that Jentz was the only prisoner ever to escape from Daytona. Throughout 1945 and into 1946, the folks at home were reading about escaped prisoners in the press on a regular basis. And they were seeing the FBI wanted posters on the walls of post offices all across the United States. In addition, articles in the press were telling Americans how much better POWs had it than they did. As the federal government asked Americans to sacrifice things through rationing so that the boys overseas could have what they needed. And the folks at home did their best. They knew they couldn't get steel anymore, so wooden bumpers were used on cars. Fuel was rationed. You had to have a certain ticket to be able to get any kind of fuel, if it was even available. And Americans were being forced to ration their food. And while not exactly happy about it, Americans at least understood that there was a need for food for the GIs to keep going. So they were willing to put up with the inconvenience. 
And as more and more articles were written, what they weren't willing to put up with was the lavish meals being served to the German POWs. You see, under the Articles of the Geneva Convention, America was forced to give the POWs the same rations that they gave to their own soldiers. Even German soldiers in the field didn't get that kind of allotment. Some German POWs even claimed that they gained weight while in American custody. At this point, the American public wanted answers. As American troops continued to sweep through Europe, they found out the true state of American POWs that were held in Germany. To say the least, the American public was not happy. And Americans wanted to know why we were treating the German POWs so well when they didn't treat our own boys the same way. The question that was echoed by political commentator Walter Winchell, for one, and the chairman of the House Military Affairs Committee, Andrew Jackson May of Kentucky. And putting Florida at the forefront of the investigation was our own congressman, Robert L. Sykes. And a comprehensive article was written by none other than the Provost Marshal General of the United States, Major General Lurch. In it, he explained the Geneva Convention and how we treated prisoners of war in accordance with it. In an effort to reduce coddling, an effort was made to recruit returning soldiers to act as MPs in POW camps. As more and more of Germany was occupied, the House Committee on Military Affairs decided to hold hearings into the coddling of the POWs in the United States. While the Army held their own investigation, they still stuck strictly to the Geneva Convention. So much so that in the final report issued by the committee, they sided with the U.S. Army. The Army did take steps to change the prisoner's menu, and finally, the Nazi salute was abolished. Shortly, the entire problem with POWs was to come to an end anyway, because the war was coming to an end and the prisoners were going to be repatriated. And with the coming of victory in Europe, all America wanted to do was get back to normal. And for the POWs, it was a desire to return home. Although one of them never did, and I'm going to link to the History Guys video on this. Eventually, Camp Gordon Johnson closed, and along with it, all of the branch camps were transferred over to Camp Landing. And one by one, as the branch camps closed, more personnel were moved back to Camp Landing itself, although Camp Landing was losing POWs as they were repatriated. And as far as the two Central Florida bases I didn't mention, Kissimmee and Sanford Naval Air Station, well, they didn't have POW camps, but they did use the POWs from Orlando. At this point, I want to take the opportunity to cover a little bit of history of the Florida Highway Patrol. Because at the start of World War II, it was only two years old. With volunteers in the draft, the Highway Patrol lost about half its members to the military. One trooper was even killed while serving with the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. Byron P. Tiller, serving in the United States Navy as a gunner's mate, was killed along with seven others on the USS Hancock when they were attacked. His body was never recovered. The head of Florida's Highway Patrol had entered World War I as a private and finished as the first lieutenant. When World War II rolled around, he was recalled and eventually achieved the rank of lieutenant colonel. Upon his return from the war, he was reappointed as director of the Highway Patrol and served until 1970. The Highway Patrol headquarters in Tallahassee bears his name to this day. Manpower was reduced another 25% when the Highway Patrol took over driver's license responsibilities in 1941. During the war years, the Highway Patrol's main duty was escorting convoys up and down the coast, as well as assisting the FBI with rounding up suspected enemy agents and escape POWs. With more and more soldiers returning to the ranks of the Highway Patrol, they were able to return to the level of service they'd had before the war and continue on to this day. I hope you enjoyed this small glimpse into Central Florida history, and if you want to see more, just let me know in the comments below.